Hi, everyone. Welcome to the R Packages Book Club with R4DS. Um, this week, we'll be going over Chapter 13. We'll start uh, the topic of testing um, with, with just the basics. Um, and I think there are a couple more testing chapters after this. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this. Um, if you're not familiar with testing, this is a good uh, good overview and, and a good place to get started. Um, excuse me, as I go on, feel free to unmute and ask any questions. Um, feel free to put things in the chat too. I'll, I'll try to monitor that. Um, so for today, our learning objectives are, <clears throat> excuse me, are the following. Um, we'll go over the benefits of automated testing. Um, a lot of this is going over the test that package, um, the primary package for testing in R, or maybe I should say the most popular. Um, and then the basics of of testing and, and some of the principles behind uh, why we test. Um, so I guess the simplest reason why we test, we, we want to make sure that our code is actually working. Um, <clears throat> and when we make changes, we want to make sure that the code still works. Um, so this might look like, th this could look like several different things, but a typical uh, testing workflow might be creating a function, running it in the console, um, seeing if there's any errors or if you have to fix anything, uh, making any necessary changes, and then just going from there. Um, <clears throat> that's interactive testing. Uh, it's all it's all done by hand. There, there's no automation to that. Um, that's kind of what intuitively um, happens as you learn to code and, and learn to fix things so they run. That's um, sort of our uh, introduction to testing. Um, but we want to make it more robust and uh, repeatable. Um, yeah, so we already test, but we want to make sure um, we can we can do it several times. So yeah, like I said, we might write a function and in the package um, development world, uh, we load it with dev tools load all, uh, experiment with it, play around, and then rinse and repeat. Um, that's definitely a workflow and and um it's it's useful, um, but there there are benefits to automating this workflow and and getting into that test driven um, mindset and and even development. Um, so, what are some of those benefits of automated or unit testing? Um, I, I think uh, if you're coming from other languages, uh, you might be familiar with uh, the term unit testing. Um, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, so one of the benefits, if you're just doing everything ad hoc, um, you're not really, it's really hard to remember everything you've done. Um, when you know manually going through 
and testing it out by hand. Um, so this, uh, this lets you write it down and repeat it. That way you don't have to go back and remember it all, or maybe like uh, going through your um, like our studio history to like see what you ran in the past. Um, it's it's there and ready to run again. Um, another benefit, um, this one might come to mind with testing. Um, like first, maybe one of the one of the big benefits is fewer bugs. Um, and so uh, they made a point in the book um, that when you're developing tests, uh, you have more of um, an adversarial mindset compared to um, informal testing. Um, this might not always be the case, um, but I guess it is natural to um, test like the edge cases of your function. Um, if you're just typing things out um, kind of ad hoc and informal, um, it may just be like trying to get your code to run um, and like it's they said it was similar to like have any an example in the docs um uh but for the automated testing and 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 writing that out for your functions um you get more of that adversarial mindset and uh you can really get down and like scrutinize your code to make sure that it works like as much as you can Uh, Stas says, why test? I would put bullet points, make sure the code works, dot, 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 according to the expectations. A lot of my test failures are reflected in the changes in the expectations. E.g., for example, I decide to return a data frame instead of list, and a failed return type reminds me that I need to change the test and very likely to redocument. Yeah, that, that's definitely a good point. Um, there's also a component of making sure the code fails as expected, and it's probably even more important. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, thank thank you for those comments. Um, I'm not sure how much I'll dive to in the weeds of uh, like testing philosophy. Um, this chapter will be a lot of, uh, a high level overview and the basics, um, but definitely feel free to, um, uh, add your comments in the chat or, or ask questions or whatever. Um, definitely love, uh, the dis discussion. Okay. Yeah. Some of it's covered in, uh, a couple of the other chapters as well. Um, so those are those are two of the benefits. Um, another one is better code structure. Uh, if you're having a hard time writing a test, uh, that might be a sign that you need to refactor your code. Um, something to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, they called this next one call to action. Um, so basically, generally test driven development, I'm not sure if it's uh, exactly like one to one, but um, basically you're writing your code in a way to get your test to pass. Um, so you you come up with a test and then your goal is figuring out a way to get your uh, function or, or whatever to pass that test. 
Um, and so that's, uh, that can be helpful for um, development and, and package development. Um, and then last is uh, uh, robustness. Um, if you know that all the major functionality of your package is well covered by the test, you can confidently make uh, big changes in your code without worrying about um, breaking something. Uh, those are helpful guide rails for making your code more robust. Um, yeah, those, those are the main uh, benefits that they covered. Um, would be curious if, uh, if folks have other benefits that they've seen in testing. Um, yeah, feel free to put that in the chat. I think just to kind of reiterate or whatever on the, I guess, better code structure mostly that, um, once you have tests, it's a lot easier to change things like way, way, way easier. Cause you're not, you don't have to worry. Oh, is this still working the same way? If your tests are good, then you know, it works. And so you can take something where you're like, well, I hacked it in and I got it working, but I don't like how that works. And you can fix it without worrying that, uh, you know, is this going to break my code? So I am a big fan of that aspect of testing. Hmm. Yeah, okay. thank you. That's yeah, I that's think, a good point. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think that creating a unit test forces us to create minimal reproducible examples for each part. So basically, sometimes we have a, a huge and we a huge data set. We want to make some transformations, but when you are creating your test, you need to create a minimal reproducible example that you can run every time you build your package. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, oh, we have another we have another comment. Uh, I think this is such a helpful chapter, especially for those of us that don't come from a dev background. Um, I'm in academia, never never learned test driven development, um, so totally new my mindset. Uh, John is totally right about it being easier to change things too. Yes, and and definitely plus one for uh, reprex or the minimal uh, reproducible example. Um, one thing that, and maybe this will maybe we'll get into this discussion um, in the following weeks as well. But and and maybe some today too. But one thing I'm always like curious about is. Um, uh, like how to write good tests or how to know that you're um, writing good tests and, and have good coverage. Um, maybe that's more of a philosophy thing. Um, I feel like I asked that in a past uh, Q&A uh, with Hadley Wickham, and I'm not sure if uh, he said that was something that he was working on uh, getting in writing, but that's always uh, spinning around in my mind as I'm thinking about testing. Um, yeah, so speaking of uh, the philosophy of testing and, and uh, you know, some of the, um, what's the word for it? Some of the, um, background of, of Tessa and, and its inspirations. Um, this is uh, straight from the Tessa package uh, website. Um, I don't, I don't think I'll read this all, um, but I do, uh, I did find it funny that it said Tessa tries to make testing as fun as possible. Um, Testing should be addictive, so you do it all the time. <laughs> I thought I liked that. Um, uh, 
uh, yeah, so uh, to make that happen, test that provides functions that make it easy to describe what you expect a function to do, including catching errors, warnings, and messages. Um, it easily integrates into your ex existing workflow, whether it's informal testing on the command line, uh, building test suites, which we'll get into next week, I believe, or using our command check. Um, and then, yeah, it does a good job of just like visually um, showing you whether it passed, failed, or what the errors are. Um, I didn't get into um, too much of the background and inspiration, um, but I did find that it was interesting that um, a lot of the inspiration comes from Ruby, um, innovative testing libraries like RSpec, Testy, Bacon, and Cucumber. Um, I think I did look at one of them and it also said that they wanted to make testing fun. Um, so I don't know if that's like, I don't know if they're trying to just sell it as fun so you can, so they get you to test or maybe some people actually find testing fun. Um, I thought it was funny. Um, I, I thought it was interesting, or I think it's interesting that test that is um, the most popular um, unit testing package for our, um, I mean, I guess I don't find that interesting, but I do find it interesting that there's like four testing libraries they reference for Ruby and test that is, I guess the only one I'm aware of for R. Um, maybe there are others. Uh, yeah, I was I was waiting for that. Um, oh, maybe maybe not. Oh, hello hello Tan, welcome. Uh, I'm all for derailments. Um, Anyone seen used describe plus it workflows before? Russ Hyde introduced it to me and I've experimented with it using it to replace context plus test that. It feels like it helps with thinking about things in a test driven development way. Hmm. I will um, I will punt that to other folks if they have uh, comments on that. I'm not familiar. I've seen it, uh, well, twice, I guess, technically, once in actual use, and then once because we did the Test That book club mm -hmm. <laughs> and read all of the docs. Uh, it doesn't feel completely done to me is the main reason I haven't switched to that. And yes, there was that. Uh, yeah, we read all the docs. Uh, oh. There aren't that many docs, so it didn't take that long. Um, but yeah, there's weird things in, in the test that docs, which we'll get into some of in here. Uh, but that, that stuff is it, is part of it. And in that, in the chat, BDD is behavior driven development, which is slightly different than test driven mm -hmm. development. And that's what it's aimed at. Um, and actually, uh, cucumber is, I think what that stuff is modeled on. So it looked mm -hmm. familiar because I had used cucumber a thousand years ago. Um, but yeah, I haven't really dug into that. Um, mostly because like you have to teach everyone, if anyone wants to contribute to your package, you have to teach them a whole other system in order for them to write tests. I don't know about like I don't like that idea. And then oh yeah, I did also link to there's a, another package that is just written to be as small as possible hmm. for testing. Um I have seen like tweets and probably toots about it, but I've never used it. Uh, interesting. Oh, and then I, I think um, 
someone made something. It might still use test that. But they made something that like auto generates tests. Hmm. It either auto generates tests from examples or auto generates examples from tests. I can't remember for sure which direction. I think it was from examples. So if you put examples in your documentation, there's a package that will pull those out and turn them into tests. Um, but I don't remember anything about that. I'll try to dig that up before we finish this test section. Cool. Um, yeah, I think also thank you for um, explaining uh, BDD or behavior driven <laughs> development. Um, I, when I was like internet searching test driven development, like one of the hits was like, this is why uh, test driven development's going out of style or <laughs> something like that. So it's, it's good to know like other philosophies. Sweet. Um, oh, sweet. Is this another um, testing package as well? Mm. Oh, cool. Help for writing unit tests based on function examples. Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of uh, the overview of TESAT and um, what it aims to do and, and some of its uh, inspiration. Um, and for the rest of the time, we will um, go into the, the workflow of what um, developing test looks like, um, and then go through some of those steps as well. Um, definitely feel free to um, comment or, or ask any questions. Um, this is like the PowerPoint um, overview of the material. Um, so definitely plenty of room for discussion. Um, so like the basic workflow of getting uh, tests into your package and, and using using tests. Um, so you, you have your package already set up. Um, the first thing you want to do is um, set up the package uh, development with um, use this um and there's a function for that um use test that uh the book also recommends that um you use the argument three um that's for using uh version three of test that uh it's i guess brand new and uh there's more functionality with this edition compared to some of the past ones. Um, I think some of that might be like snapshots being introduced. Um, I'm not sure. I think there might be some other things like snapshots. Yeah, snapshots was the, the big thing. Um, and you don't need to explicitly use the context or actually I think you either can't or just they would highly recommend that you don't use the context function anymore mm. which used to be a more formal way to write tests um that's the main thing uh but yeah snapshots were the big thing that they added I'm sure uh, I can't think of it but there are like um reporting differences like it version three, there will be little things that if you switch something from version two to version three, the when you run your tests, I can't remember exactly what, but some things are clearer. Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that comment. Um, I remember the context function uh, was in a little footnote on the book. 
Um, oh, sweet. You, if you just use um, use test, um, it will automatically do it uh, for you, setting everything up. Um, yeah, that's like, um, that's like the great thing about uh, like test that and some of these packages like, uh, like it could be a function or um, even like setting up the whole test environment. Um, there's a lot of different like shortcuts that it just does it for you. So that's, yeah, th thank you for that. That's good to know. Um, so you can use an older version and like update later, but yeah, they recommend just using version three. Um, and then you can make a test uh, using the use test function. Um, running a set of tests with uh, test that test file. And then you can run uh, the entire testing suite with uh, devs tools check or dev tools test. Um, and I think DevTools check does more things than test. Um, is that right? Like test just runs all the tests and then check goes through like more than yeah. that. Yeah. Check is the full, uh, RCMD check that does all kinds of things. It's not just your test set. Um, and I think that's like Appendix A it goes into oh. everything that's in there. Are we? Do we have a week for uh, the appendix, or under? I'm not. I can't remember if it's on the list, but we can talk about it when we're getting there. Okay. Oh yeah, it looks like uh, 23. Yeah. Nice. Check in the chat. Um, three and four can be done in our studio. Uh, and will launch into a background process, which is helpful for you to continue to work in console and probably works better in terms of isolating the environment. Uh, sweet. Um, yeah, that's definitely helpful. If, uh, it makes, makes it a smoother like workflow overall. If, if you're doing test-driven development and like constantly uh like making edits and then testing as well um so going into each one of those uh steps um uh usually done once per package um and then if you already have it you can opt into the third edition as well um yeah, I'm guessing the multiple times per package would just be updating the addition. Um, I'm not sure if there are other reasons for doing that. Um, but when you run this, uh, the function uh, goes ahead and creates a new directory called test uh, slash test that. Um, and then it adds test that to the suggest field in the description. Um, and then when you specify uh, the third edition, it uh, puts that in the um, addition field under uh, the config. Um, and then it creates a file test slash test that dot r. Um, and this runs all your tests when the R command check is uh, is run. Um, and their note is, do not edit this. Okay, my feeling with that uh, third edition is that the authors want to protect the users from major breaking changes in future versions. Uh, think Python 2.7 versus 3.0. Yeah, that's uh, 
that's smart. Um, definitely, definitely a pain whenever updating big versions like that for software. So the next test, or sorry, the next step in our workflow is to make a test. Um, uh, this is similar to like, they make it super easy for you. Uh, there's uh, a lot of different ways that you can do this um, and a lot of different ways that you can type it out and it just works. Um, but you create and open a test file for say whatever our file you have. Um, and then you wanna use this, use test, and then that file name. Um, if it's already made, uh, the function will just open it. Um, and if your function is active in the editor, uh, you can even just use the function and it will work. Um, you will want to follow the same uh, name and structure for the test, and it should match the R file structure as well. Um, and then I believe that when you do create this, it will be like test slash test dash boofy dot R. Um, and there's, there's like several other ways that you can create this as well. Oh, yes. Uh, good reminder from, from chapter two, uh, highly recommend uh, the hotkeys. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, if, if you're doing a bunch of load, load all and uh, running test, uh, there's a ton of helpful shortcuts that will just make your life easier. Um, just going through before we uh, continue uh, or create the test file first and then the R file. Uh, yeah, good point. Uh, you don't have to, you can go one way or the other. Um, uh, and then do you know if having the test files match the R file structure is mandatory or just highly preferred? Um, like would things totally crash and burn if they didn't quite match? I've never been clear. Um, nothing breaks per se, but it would works better when they match. Yeah, and yeah, that's good to know. Uh, it is helpful to know like, oh yeah, this, goes with this and like if someone else is in your package they uh can like follow the file structure to find like what they need easier okay um so just the basic uh test file structure um when uh, when you do create a test, um, it will um, it will create this uh, like a demo test or this is the filler that that shows up. Um, and so this is like the basic format of what that looks like. Um, you'll have the function, um, a short description of what your test is doing um, in, in quotations, and then uh, brackets, and then you have uh, different expectations for each test. Um, we'll go over some of those uh, later on uh, for this one, for this example here. Um, test that multiplication works um, two times two. And this is also the format, like this is what you're expecting. And this is like the input. Um, so you're expecting those four and four to be equal. Um, 
and then your test will pass if that's true. Um, so I took the, um, I forget what it was called. Uh, I, I took um, a workshop at the art studio conference and it was, it went over this book and, and testing was part of uh, one of the workshop days. Um, they recommended um, that you only have two to six expect functions inside each test. Um, and then anything beyond that, uh, they suggested um, breaking it up into multiple tests. Um, so I'm not sure if others have like a similar opinion or or if like um, if that makes sense to others as well. Um, I thought it was a good rule of thumb. Um, yeah, and then. I guess going back to like being confused on testing, like to have this as an example, uh, like I look at it, I'm like, of course, like two times two equals four. Like why, why wouldn't it? Uh, but maybe like, I don't know, maybe there are other, uh, maybe it's just there because it's like an easy way to show that it should be equal. Um, it's funny to me that they do it that way because um, Jenny talked about wanting to do uh, she might have even done a search and found all the like thousands of CRAN packages that have this test in it in them <laughs> um, I think they should make it a breaking test so that you have to fix it mm. because, because since it's an example of a test that works people just leave it and that's a bad idea. <laughs> like you shouldn't have a test that doesn't actually do anything. So um, I think it's nice of them to make it a test that will automatically pass, but they, I mean, it should just be expect true then or success, succeed, yeah. something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's funny to me because you can, like, if you do a GitHub search for multiplication works, you'll come up with just tons and tons <laughs> and tons of uh, our packages. <laughs> Yeah, I could see like, I could see too, like someone doesn't change the description, but they like change the expectations and it's like, doesn't match up or whatever. That's, that's funny. Uh, uh, I'll just glance at the messages to see if there's, um, keep in mind that each expect function shows up as a test in DevTools test output. I found myself writing some loops for tests, so I usually end up with expect true that summarizes over the loop results. Uh, is there more set.seed1 or test that multiplication works on GitHub? Oh yeah, I'm I'm sure. Uh, I that was another one. Um, uh, uh... Max Kuhn in an example had a specific set seed. I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was, you know, like a five digit number. And so that started to show up all over the place on GitHub because people were copy pasting out of uh, the documentation of carrot or something like that. <laughs> so it is funny to see the copy paste things that happen. That's good. Uh, by the way, you oh, are. I, I was really just gonna say I've like been sun. <laughs> yeah, I've been sun setting behind me. Uh, Zoom cannot figure can, out what to do with you. Hold on, let me go uh, <laughs> fix the blinds or something. I'll I'll be right it, back. It's no big deal. In fact, well, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no. I oh he I has that reappeared. One's, oh it's still there. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. I'll just stand uh over here now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I knew the sun was coming down. Like this is the <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Uh 
is like the golden hour right now. And it's sunny in Ohio, which is rare. Um, all right, we've got uh we got a couple more slides. I think we should be able to get through this all. Um just an overview of the expect functions. Um they call it the atom of testing, basically like the smallest unit you can have uh for a test that makes up um that's like at the center of like the whole testing uh environment or whatever like that's the smallest uh unit that you can have um they all start with expect underscore and then uh like blah 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 um i i kind of mentioned this in the uh test example um there's two main arguments uh, the first is the actual result and the second is what you expect the result to be. Um, if actual and expected don't agree, test that throws an error. Um, and then some have additional arguments for, for some finer details. Uh, and there are over 40 expectations in the package. Um, yeah, we, we're not going to go over all 40, but definitely uh, as you continue to develop your, your testing muscle, uh, feel free to check those out. Um, here we go. Uh, some of the ones that, that I highlighted and uh, that the book also highlighted, um, expect equal. Um, I can't remember if that was the same one in the sample, um, but there is a tolerance to this one. Um, uh, I can't remember what the like specific tolerance was, but um, say you're within like uh, a thousandth of a decimal or something, um, like. 10 and 10.001 is going to, uh, it's going to say it's true. Um, so if you want something that's, um, more strict, um, you can use expect identical. Um, and I think you can, going back to the, uh, additional arguments, you can also set, um, like your tolerance level that you want as well. Um, expect true, expect false, um, pretty much what it says, uh, check if something's true or if something's false. Um, and then I think as was, uh, like alluded into a previous comment, um, you can check for errors too, or you can write tests to like, um, go at it from a different angle um by like testing for errors uh, okay so it's some comments on uh, uh expect equal and, and the test that tolerance um okay uh tol is deprecated um so that uh use tolerance for your argument instead um, oh, and then a couple other ones. Um, these are like shortcut expectations. Um, like there are, could be other ways to write these, but uh, since these are like so common, they, they made uh, specific functions for them. Um, expecting if an object has the same length as what you expect. And then you can uh, match like strings as well using expect match. Um, and there are like, like 30, 35 more. Um, I'm not sure if they're adding, uh, if they're continuing 
let me start over. I'm not sure if they're adding like more as they update um, the test that package, but uh, there should be plenty to uh, choose from. Uh, yeah, John says uh, that he likes to start with errors, then once I'm catching specific input errors in specific ways, uh, then uh, I start my real test. Okay. Yeah, that's that's why I love like getting uh, like different ways to like do test driven development or or any other testing uh, development. Like I like the different ways that people uh, tackle it. Um, and then the last slide here, uh, uh, just a general overview of snapshot test, um, which was introduced with the third edition. Um, not everything can be covered by um, just writing code. Uh, it can be difficult or awkward to describe expected results uh, with just code. Um, so snapshots are a great solution to this problem. Um, the basic concept is that it records a result in a human readable file. And then like it, so it takes a snapshot of this file. At some point in the future, you take another uh, snapshot and then you compare results like that's my understanding of this. Um, it's useful for monitoring uh, user interfaces, um, testing images, or other complicated objects. I think like plots and uh, I think this is helpful for um, like Shiny as well. Um, just like a few examples of where you might encounter snapshot test or or utilize them. Um, yeah. Uh, others feel free to comment. Um, I'm not too overly familiar with snapshot test. Uh, so yeah, I'd be interested to hear others uh, feedback on that. They're really nice for like error messaging and warnings and that kind of thing. Um, I a lot of times I'll start with snapshot tests and then try to get rid of them because they tend to be pretty fragile. Um, if something like if you change the name of a column or something, I mean that's I guess that would break a lot of things. But I don't know. There are like minor things you can do that would break a snapshot test. Um, you change the wording of an error, but it's still the same error. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's uh, you have to watch out for those. And then the other thing with them is you really shouldn't snapshot something that is being produced by a different package than yours. So like if the error is being thrown by some other package, if you're snapshotting that and they change their test or their their output, but it's still the same thing. Um, I mean, maybe you want to know that it changed, but if it's just a slight wording change or something, yeah. Um, if your package is on CRAN, basically you're preventing them from getting accepted on CRAN because your test will fail from their update and you didn't really fail. Uh, so like snapshot tests are nice, but I think be really cautious around them. And we'll talk about that more in the next couple of weeks. Um, my research assistant ended up using snapshot test for a data cleaning yeah. function where we needed to make sure that the output data kept the same exact data format before he changed the workflow a bit. Okay. Yeah, that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just I was going to totally agree that that's a good place where if you're going to like really um, tear something apart and you want it to be exactly the same when you're done, then... Uh, mm -hmm. That's a good place. Or, you know, the snapshot test can also show you what changed. So it's not like out of the question or whatever, but it just don't only use snapshot tests would be my big thing.
Cool. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, I'm I'm glad we we discussed that further because I my understanding of snapshot test was limited. Um, sweet. Uh, do are there any uh, other questions or or comments on this chapter? Um, that was all I had for this week. Um. Hopefully you you learned something. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll stop sharing as well. I like that they split this all up. This used mm. to be, I think one, I think they had one testing chapter, maybe two, and it was just too much. And so I like that they kind of, you know, this is like the philosophy of testing. And then the next one is actually still some more kind of philosophy. Um, and then uh, getting into like advanced topics in a totally separate chapter. So I like it. Um, yeah, they're, like they're not small chapters either. So to have, <laughs> have that all bunched up, that's... Um, well, they definitely also added a lot when they okay. did the splitting um yeah. because partly because uh you know test that version three didn't exist for the first version of the book it was probably like test that changed a lot since the first edition of the book um mm -hmm. and yeah you can certainly you can have many many books on testing even though like i said the documentation for test that isn't that detailed and that kind of surprised me when we dug into it um they don't go into philosophy a lot in there mm. but you know like you said um i have the links to those workshop slides somewhere where they it's basically the workshops of these chapters or you know a lot of the workshop was these three chapters so i'll make sure that we have those handy um was that for the um Master class or a different one? The yeah, the master class. It is. Okay. I will also um <laughs> I think I have the link to the 2022 um workshop. It is called Building Tidy Tools. And it was basically mm. um a lot of it was the R packages book. Um so I'm gonna I'll add that to the chat as well. Oh, cool. Um it looks like um it looks like for next week uh we have uh on hub uh going over designing your test suite. Um and it looks like for this, since this is updated on how uh, the next two chapters do not have uh, slides already built. Um, so just be aware of that um, to be ready for next week. Yes, thanks, Robbie. Cool. If, uh, if anyone doesn't have anything else, uh, I think we can end early. All right. All right. See everyone online. Thanks. See everyone. <laughs>